The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi there, everybody. Welcome to the Lunch and Learn series. Uh, Tim Baker is my name. I'm looking forward to working with you over the next uh, several months. Um, I just want to do a little sound check. I've had a couple of, uh, as a lot of us have, I've been online quite a bit this morning and I've had a few issues with the audio. So could I just ask you, if you wouldn't mind, go to the question box. You'll see it on the right hand side and just open it up. Could you cl click in the word or type in the word clear if I'm coming across loud and clear? That would be appreciated. I just wanted to see where people, if people can hear me loud and clear. So just type in the word clear if, uh, if you could. Okay, um, so welcome anyway. Uh, I'll just wait to see if we've got some people who um, I'm hoping I'm coming across loud and clear. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn off my webcam. That might help. All right. Okay, so um, folks, I'm going to just a couple of housekeeping issues before we launch into the session today. Um, I'll be sending you every time we have one of these six sessions over the next two weeks, they'll ha happen every couple of weeks, I'll be sending you a copy of the slides and the recording. So you'll get a copy of those. Uh, you'll get an email from me this afternoon regarding that. So um, if things don't quite go well in terms of sound today, uh, I'll certainly be sending that out to you. The second issue is that in between the sessions, um, I'd like you to try a few things. So I'm going to set you a little bit of homework and give you an opportunity to try a few different, uh, uh, you know, things that you can you can apply. So we'll give you that opportunity, and I'll talk about that obviously at the end of the session. Um, all right, and of course, any time that you've got a question, you've got a comment or an observation, you're more than welcome to, to uh, add to that by going to that question box and typing in the question. I'm the only one that gets to see it, and when I see it, of course, I'll respond to it. So I'm, I'm, that's the way we keep this very participatory. All right, so let's get stuck into the session and the program in general. And uh, let's go to have a look at the program. As you can see there uh, on your screen, you've got the six sessions that I'm running. And you can see there uh, that we're going to look at managing performance strategically today. So it's more around the big picture about how you should be managing performance as a senior manager. Next time we meet, uh, you'll have an opportunity to complete an influencing capability profile if you haven't already, but you get a chance to debrief on how you can improve your influencing capability at the executive level. So we'll spend a bit of time on that. And then in session three, we're going to talk about creating thinking space. And I think this is one of the big issues that we've got in our world that we're so busy, we don't get time to create that space to be able to think and so we're just being pushed from pillar to post, from one meeting to the next, and it just continues that way. In session four, I'm going to give you a couple of options around uh, organising, you know, structures in your workplace. And I think you're probably at a sufficiently senior enough level to be able to look at that. And I'll explain that to you and give you a couple of options every time you structure uh, an organisation, a department, or a team even. When you do that, there are going to be pluses and minuses with that. In other words, there's no such thing as the perfect structure. So I'm going to talk about a few of those. And then in, in uh, Unit 5, we're going to talk about conflict and negotiation and the, about the ability to improve your capacity to negotiate. Because let's face it, at your level, it's likely that you do, whether you recognise it or not, quite a lot of negotiation and conflict management. So we obviously need to improve our skills in that area. And in unit six, we'll look at driving positive cultural change because lots of organisations have asked me about how do we create a productive workplace culture? 
And I'm going to talk about that in, in Unit 6. All right, so that's where we're going. Um, I just wanted to do a quick sound check. Just type in the word clear in the question box if I'm coming across loud and clear, or, not, or if I'm not, just type in the word unclear. I just wanted to see how we're traveling with this at this stage. While you're thinking about doing that, let's move on. There's basically three things that I want to cover today. Here we go. We've got a comment here. I just got to open that up and see. No. All right. So just I'm going to be looking at three things. I'm going to look at a performance management framework and I'm, basically everything that's thought about, that's done and uh, you know, thought about or done is actually supposed to be about improving performance. And I think that often we lose sight of this and we spend a lot of time, thanks Jenny, on and off. Yeah, okay, I'm just doing my best here. Hopefully um, things will clear up. There's not much I can do. I'm at the mercy of the internet, which I guess we all are. The second thing I'll look at is job descriptions. I'm not a great fan of job descriptions and I, I, I'm certainly a fan of a work document, no doubt, but I'm not always in favour of the concept of the job description. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, and then I'm going to talk about performance development conversations, which is hugely underrated in workplaces. and as a really important point about moving forward from there. Okay. So what I'm going to share with you now as up on your screen is you can see there that this is my version of the relationship between strategic operational and performance planning. And I just want to make the point because I think it, at a strategic level, it's important that you have a good grasp of this. And if you look at the top of the pyramid, you've got a vision statement. Now, I, I, think, I think the the buzzword these days is a purpose statement, but regardless of what we might call it, this is a statement that identifies in short form where the organisation's heading. It's an aspiration. And all organisations have a vision statement or they sh should at least have one, but I find that a lot of them are either too long or uninspiring or not clear. There's a lot of things that could be wrong with that. And, and of course, if you don't get that right, then everything else hangs off that and you've got a problem in terms of your own organisation. A mission statement, and there's a bit of, mis, there's a bit of uh, you know, there's a difference of viewpoint about this. That I think the mission statement is about how we will achieve the vision. So this is the how to, but once again, it's a short statement. And so as a short statement, it becomes uh, the really how we will actually achieve the vision. Then we have a set of values by which the organisation chooses to operate. These are the behavioural values that we expect people to exhibit. And usually I think any more, well, I would say to you that any more than four of those and you get yourself into strife because people, one, won't remember them and two, there's just too many. So the, the idea is to go for about four critically important values that give expression to the mission and the vision. And then, of course, you've got your five-year goals. And those goals, are, you know, each department has a series of goals and those goals are pretty much how we will operate in our own team environment. And then objectives are more about the next 12 months and what do we need to do in order to achieve the goal? What has to happen in the next 12 months? What do we need to do? And the strategies, of course, are how we're going to get there. And number seven is who's going to be accountable for that? So who in the organisation becomes accountable for that? And then, of course, you've got your job descriptions or position descriptions. And those descriptions, of course, give a small bite-sized piece of the overall work that's required for organisations. I'll talk a little bit more, of course, as I mentioned about job descriptions. And then, of course, you have the performance appraisal that normally goes on once a year. Now, again, I'm not a great fan of performance or what I might call review, performance reviews. I'm not sure that they actually really help. And I want to just talk about performance conversations as distinct from performance reviews. 
But at the end of the day, the point here being is that all of these bits and pieces have to lock in and be consistent with each other. And of course, if they're not consistent with each other, we end up in a situation where people end up doing what a colleague of mine calls fake work. Fake work, as distinct from fake news, is about work that doesn't really directly or indirectly contribute to the strate strategic direction of the organisation. So this is a very, um, it's important to try to align what people are doing as much as possible so that everything that's said, done and thought about is actually in relation to attempting directly or indirectly to achieve the vision that the organisation has set for itself. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about a couple of those at the top of the apex today, but I won't go through all of them. And then I'll, then I'll come down to talk about number eight, the position description or job description, and perhaps give you a better alternative and then talk about number nine, which is around performance conversations. So you've got your strategic plan here, your operational plan here, and your management or performance down here. So that's a little framework that you might like to consider. Now, I would say that the issue of the, uh, the vision of an organisation is a bit like the coat hanger that happens to be in your cupboard. And I've got plenty in my cupboard, I'm sure you have. They seem like they breed. But the truth of the matter is the coat hanger on its own is a fairly useless um, piece of metal, usually made of metal. Uh, and, but it is quite useful when we want to hang a garment from it. So obviously the coat hanger is there to, to do a particular job. And the coat hanger itself is very much like the vision statement in the sense that we hang off the coat hanger a piece of clothing, but in terms of the organisation, we hang off the vision statement, everything that should be done and planned to be done from the vision statement. So that's why I like to use the definition of the coat hanger that most of us sneer when we hear the word vision, but at the end of the day, it actually is quite important in terms of its role in organisations. Again, I've seen many, many vision statements and some of them I think are very good and some of them are very poor. And I think that if you looked at a vision statement that actually ticks all the boxes, I'd expect that it would inspire because what's the point of having a vision statement that's, that doesn't inspire? To provide the best customer service we can does not really engender a lot of inspiration. And so how could we rewrite that? Now, inspire doesn't mean writing something that's untruthful. It just simply means that it should get us uh, excited about the vision. It should clearly set priorities around what's important to the organisation, and it should do that in a very broad sense. I've actually seen some vision statements take two pages to write. A vision statement should be written in one simple sentence. And in fact, the shorter it is, the better. Because, you know, you're going to flesh that out, obviously, in terms of the goals and the plans and the mission and all the rest of it. So one statement is enough. It should also remind us of who your customer is. Now, I know we've got people in this workshop, for example, <clears throat> whose customers may not be members of, uh, you know, a customer in the truest sense of the word, but everybody, no matter who we are, has got some end user that will rely on the services or the goods that we produce. And of course, the vision statement should encapsulate who that, who that is, not specifically, of course, but in general terms. And so if you're a government department and we've got a couple here, well, obviously it's the public and, you know, having that embedded in the vision statement would be extremely important in my view. Of course, if it's a business, then it would be customers. Uh, if it's an educational institution, then of course it would be perhaps the children or parents or both. 
So it must have something obviously to do with that because that's why we're all here. I mean, at the end of the day, you're my customers. And, uh, you know, if I'm writing a vision statement, I need to think about you because that is ultimately why I'm standing here giving you this presentation today. Now, the other thing is, of course, that the vision statement should give a sense of direction. So what we're aiming to do is to give the organisation a sense of direction of where they should be heading. So you can see there's a lot of you know, value in having a vision statement that's written correctly. And so you can see on your screen now, you've got the vision and the values and the mission and the five year goals, they all lock in together and <clears throat> they should also be very coherent. So one of the things you might like to do, depending on how senior you are in the organisation, is you might want to review your vision and your values and your mission and your five year goals, because by doing that, you can just evaluate whether or not they're still relevant and whether or not they are written the way they should be. And don't, of course, underestimate the value of this because this is the essence of strategic management. If we don't get this part right, everything else is probably not going to be right either. So that is an important first step in, in my view. The other thing that all of us need to be mindful of, and this is a um, this is something I put together a few years ago, is we need to be mindful that the employment relationship or psychological contract, I call it, the co psychological contract, psychological meaning it's in your head and contract meaning between two or more people. So in the workplace, we have a psychological contract between the employer and employee or the employer and slash manager and employee and the contract is changing or the values by which the, that relationship operates has changed dramatically over the last 25 years. I'm not going to go through all of this on your screen but I just simply want to make the point that there is a significant shift from the left to the right. So what you're seeing on the left hand side is a very much part of the last century of you know these are the values that are critical in the relationship between the manager and the employee. Uh, I won't go into that great detail, but you can, you know, you can certainly get that information in my book down there on the right hand side where this comes from. The new organisation, in order to prosper in 2020, has to embrace the new set of values on the right hand side. So let me give you one simple example. The old value was internal focus, and that was that it, this was part of the quality assurance. So as long as we had everything in the organisation following systems, processes and procedures, then, it, then the argument would be if we could get that all systemised, it would be likely that the quality of the product or the service that came out the other end was going to be relevant and consistent. Now, of course, the customer is very fickle and can basically go to your customer, your competitors and use their services or buy their products. And by able to do that, uh, we get into a situation where uh, it's impossible to have a cook cookie cutter approach to the customer. We need to be more customer focused. And that's really important as well. Uh, Steve just says and has made a really great comment, purpose, why we do the things we do. That's brilliant. Thank you, Steve. And that, that really sums up what the purpose uh, or the vision statement's all about. Why we do why we why we do the things we do. Thank you. That's excellent. Appreciate that. I'm assuming that our audio problems are not quite so bad now. I'll just have to wait and see what people say about that. But ultimately, my point is we need to embrace what's on the right hand side. Now, I, I say that to you as a senior leader, because sometimes um, we need to just put aside the old them and us employment relationship and understand that we've got a completely new set of values, because if at your level you can't embrace the things on the right hand side, then we're going to be in a situation where perhaps 
you're going to have some friction with some of the people that you lead who may embrace the things on the right hand side where you may not or vice versa you may embrace the things on the right hand side but some of your colleagues may well be stuck in the past with the old set of values on the left hand side so just a thought now i want to talk about the concept of job descriptions and i want to make a very provocative statement if i may and that is that the roles that people play in organisations are more important than the jobs they do. Now that sounds a little bit controversial, doesn't it? But I, I will explain that in some detail and I think it's important that I do that. Um, I'm going to show you a little, and you can see down the bottom, this came from one of um, my books, uh, but I, ultimately I had another book out called The End of the Job Description. So you can imagine what I think of job descriptions. And let me explain to you why I'm quite skeptical of job descriptions. I'm a strong believer in role descriptions and I think as a senior manager, you should be looking to embrace the concept of the role description rather than the job description. Now you might say, is that just semantics? No, it's not, I'll, I will explain the difference. So let me just build up a model here for you. So let's look at the work that people do. Now, regardless of what your industry is, and we've got a fairly wide cross section of people in this, in this Lunch and Learn series, uh, everyone from government departments uh, through to uh, startup IT firms and everything in between so let's have a look but i essentially this is relevant to any of you so on the left hand side of course people have a, a job to do obviously they wouldn't be employed otherwise and that job requires certain technical skills now ultimately what the job description does is it really does try but i think unsuccessfully in a lot of cases to encapsulate that you know, what does the job look like? What are the key performance indicators? What are the key result areas? How will I be assessed and so forth? So yes, that's covered in the job description. Um, however, we always have a disclaimer at the bottom of the job description that says, and any other duty deemed relevant by the manager. In other words, it's basically having a bet each way, isn't it? If it's not written down there, it doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't need to be done. So therefore, it's obvious why people can be quite cynical about the job description. However, there's a whole raft of performance that's not captured in the job description. And this, that's on this side here on the right. And these are what are referred to in the literature as non-job roles. Now, non-job roles, the concept of the non-job roles has been around for the last 20, 25, 30 years. And academics for a long period of time have, you know, expressed the view that things that are not job related still add value in terms of performance. But the problem that they've had is they haven't been able to come to some sort of a consensus around what those generic non-job roles would be. The argument has been because different industries would have different focus points. It's impossible for us to work out what they are. Uh, I dispute that and I actually had a go at coming up with four non-job roles that I believe that every one of your industries, your organisations, what you do are critically important. Let's have a look at them and, um, and, and what I would be suggesting to you is if these non-job roles are not being fulfilled in the work that you do, it's likely that your performance will suffer. So this is the part that's often left off the job description. Let's have a look. One of the roles that I think is critically important for success in any organisation, I'm sure you'd agree, is having a positive attitude and enthusiasm. Now, I don't expect that people will come to work bouncing off the walls with excitement. That's not actually what I'm on about, but I don't expect people to come to work whinging and whining and backbiting and playing politics and passing the buck and not taking accountability, all of those things I would 
probably conclude would be a negative attitude and a lack of enthusiasm. So, but the trouble is we don't want to talk to people about these things because we think that those things are so subjective and can't be measured. But I dispute that. I think if I came to your workplace, let's say on Monday, and I sat there for 20 minutes with you and just observed people uh, doing their work, and then you and I sat down and had a cup of tea, I'll guarantee that we'd both come to the same conclusion about who was positive and who wasn't. I think we could both agree on it. I'm confident of that. I don't think there'd be any discrepancy. So in other words, it's fairly obvious what that looks like. Trouble is, of course, we're too shy to actually talk to people about that. Now, I'm not suggesting that we get into conversations around and, and, and sort of start them by saying, I want to talk to you about your poor attitude, because obviously that's going to create more of a poor attitude. It's not going to be good. But of course, we can talk about the actual implications of that, what people are doing. So for example, if somebody uh, has criticised a new member of the team in a team meeting four times in a row, uh, I could certainly talk about that with the person after the meeting, you know, the, the person being the critique, the criticiser, because that, in my view, is actually stifling the other person's potential for making a contribution. So that would be something that I might look at, but it's definitely got to play a part in performance, I'm sure you'd agree. The second role that I think is critically important in a team, and these aren't necessarily in order, is to be a what we might call a team player. Organisations now are no longer uh, hierarchies like they used to be. They're getting flatter and people are expected more than ever to be involved in short term teamwork at different points with people perhaps that they don't know. And so the idea of being a team, uh, team player is, is critically important now, than, more important now than it ever was. And yet you do hear people say in the workplace things like, um, oh, I'm not a team player. I just come to work and do my job. I do what's required of me and my job description, and I'm not interested in you know, being involved in any team, which I think is unacceptable because at the end of the day, everybody has to work in a team environment. You know, It's just the way things are in 2020. So I think that's an important role that's often not captured in the job description. So, of course, imagine if you if you were leading uh, a senior team of people who were all individuals who really didn't want to work in a team, I can assure you that this would be a very good example of why your team's not performing to where it needs to be. I'm sure you'd agree with that. Now, the third role that I think is critically important, non-job role, is what I might call a skill development role. I do expect that people will continue to grow and develop their skill set in the workplace. And the trouble is, this doesn't happen. How often have you had people say to you, oh, look, I'm too old to go to this training program, or um, I'm very comfortable using this spreadsheet, and I really don't want to upgrade my knowledge or skill. Now, when people say that, they're sabotaging themselves as much as anything else, because obviously from a career development perspective, if people have stopped growing or developing themselves, then they're likely to be left behind because the world is moving at a rapid rate of knots. But not only that, we've got a situation where um, they're... Uh, they're doing not only themselves in, but also the organisation at large as well. So that's an important role, and you very rarely see that captured in the job description. So this is about developing oneself so that they can stay on top of the latest trends and be able to do what they need to do in the, in the modern world. The fourth one I have identified is what I might call an innovation and continuous improvement role. I'm expecting that people will come to work and make suggestions in relation to um, 
how the workplace can be more efficient and effective. I don't want people to leave their brains in a paper bag at the doorway. I want them to come to work with their ideas and their enthusiasm and all the rest. But again, we don't see that written in the job description. So what I'm suggesting to you here is that those four roles are critically important when it comes to overall performance in any organisation, regardless of what industry it is. Now, I work across 21 industries and I cannot think of an industry where those four things are not important. And I'd be happy if you could correct me on that, but I think they're important for all. Now, the problem is, of course, is the job description is very much focused on the technical know-how. The job description, and you know, occasionally at the bottom of a job description, you have a few bullet points that say, um, you know, a few things that perhaps might be related to non-job roles. But because they're bullet points and because they're at the end of the document, people get the idea that they're not that important. It's just a little value added extra that really at the end of the day, I'm not going to be appraised on that. So those things are sort of discretionary. I would argue we need to elevate the non-job roles uh, to a higher status in our workplace if we're serious about getting to, to creating a high performing workplace. I would argue that. Now, just, you know, if you doubt me, just think for a moment. If you had a team of people who had a high skill set, right, they're very, very capable people, but all of them had a negative attitude, all of them were individuals rather than team players. All of them had decided to stop growing and developing as a person and, you know, uh, as a um, job holder. And that none of them were making any suggestions about how we could make the, better, the workplace more efficient and effective. I would say to you that you've got a low performing team, regardless of the technical know-how of the team members, if that makes sense. So how do you turn your job descriptions into role descriptions? Well, it's pretty simple, actually. It's not difficult. Uh, obviously, this is a job for human resource, human resources, but ultimately, it's very simple. You, and we're going to work on the assumption that your job description is written reasonably well. You take your job description, and then at the end of it, you bolt on these four non-job roles, and you flesh them out, not as bullet points, but very much around expectations around each of these four. And it's a lot more simple than you might think. And in one of my books, The End of the Job Description, I've done the work for you. So I've actually gone through and selected 10 key performance indicators for each of those non-job roles. And it's pretty straightforward. And then you go out and you get buy-in from your team. And now you create, you move your job description to a role description which ultimately means that everyone that works in your area has five roles to play. They have a job role and four non-job roles. And so therefore, all of those things are critically important to success and you will be, you know, you will be evaluated on the basis of that. So I don't think that's an unreasonable uh, request and I think you can do that fairly simply. So I just wanted to alert you to this. You might say, why have you only picked four? Well, there's probably more, but I think there's four that I could name off the top of my head, but you might find that there might be six or seven or eight or uh, I don't know, but at least you've got four to get moving. And, and as I said, uh, I was getting a little bit impatient with the fact that we couldn't get a generic set of non-job roles so I decided to come up with four myself. All right, so that will help tremendously from a strategic point of view if you can start to elevate the status of those four non-job roles so that you can expect to see people performing in those roles on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, I, I'd have to also say to you that one of the reasons that people don't perform in these non-job roles to the extent that you might like is because they don't think it's all that important and they'd be right because it's not in the work document usually. These things are not in there. So therefore, people make the fairly uh, typical assumption that they're not that important. So therefore, if they're not that important, I won't bother about them. But they are important, I think. Now, let me just...
prove to you that they are important. Um, Warner, John Warner in 2012, asked, I think it was 9,000 managers across, you know, these are senior managers across several 21 industries. I think it was a number of like three or four continents. So it was a significant survey. It was a frequency survey. And basically he asked them to identify what would be the number one job attribute that you're looking for in terms of your employees. When you recruit somebody, what is the number one attribute you're looking for? And of course, Warner collected all this data and then created a, uh, a frequency chart of the top 10. Now, before I show you what number one is, could I ask you just get just go to the question box and little have a little stab at this, have a guess. What do you think one number one might have been on the list of all the things that managers collectively had identified as the critically important attributes on the job, what do you think they were looking for? Uh, column says enthusiasm, okay. Um, Stephen says positive attitude, okay. Anyone else want to have a crack? Sarah or Sarah, it's not sure, I think it's Sarah, says proactive. Jenny says integrity. Okay, now the interesting thing about this is four of you have said and, I, and others, please feel free. We've got quite a few on the line here, so go for your life. But we've got enthusiasm, positive attitude, proactive and integrity. Interesting. Now, let's have a look at what came up. Now, the thing that about those four is you might recognise they're all non-job roles. They're all non-job roles. So no one yet has said technical prowess. Let's look at number one was on the list, and one of you nailed it, enthusiasm. In fact, two of you nailed it, enthusiasm. So, Colm and Stephen, you win a prize. Well done. Yes, it's all about, you know, this is, I remember, this is my information. This is what they said. What do you think number two was? Let's have a look. Good communication skills. We want people to be able to communicate. And that's a fair comment. Now, again, that's a non-job role. We want people who are self-starters, and I think you know being proactive is really important. And I and uh, <clears throat> uh, Sarah mentioned being proactive, so well done. And honesty. So we Jenny mentioned integrity, so we're getting close to the mark there. So honesty is important. Then we've got, we want people who like people because, of course, it's a pain in the neck of working with people that don't like people. So I can understand why that's number five on the list. Number six is persistence. Um, that's good. So we want people with stickability. Number seven is the ability to work in a team. There you go. Number eight is good organisational skills and the ability to work under pressure. Absolutely. Number nine is a willingness to learn. Okay, so we want someone who will grow and develop in role. And number 10 is we want somebody who we can depend on to get work done. Now, Warner cut it off at 10. There's obviously more around that, but what is interesting about that list is that there's nothing on that list that's a job role. I'm just trying to reinforce the point for us all that non-job roles are critically important and underestimated. And that's why I'm concerned about the job description, which really just focuses on the job role and none of the non-job roles we've gone through. So you were you nailed it. You, you know the, those of you who contributed there. You know you won't be surprised about that because your thing is up there. But the important point is that we value non-job roles more than we value job roles. That's why I said the non-job roles are actually more important than the job roles. Now, what does that mean? That we just hire people who are technically, uh, you know, no good? Not at all. 
we obviously expect people are going to have the technical capabilities to do the job, of course. But ultimately, the value add, the key, the differentiator, whatever you want to call it, is going to be the non-job role. And I think that is where we're going with this. So um, the point I'm trying to make about this is it's really, really important to do whatever you can to elevate the non-job role to its rightful status in your workplace. Now, whether that's to recraft your job descriptions and turn them into role descriptions or not is up to you. But I can tell you if you just simply stick with the document called the job description, what you're actually doing is you're downgrading the relevance and importance of non-job roles. And that's the point I want to make. So has anyone got any comment or reflection? Am I Hitting the mark here, do you guys, you, you accept the proposition that the non-job role is critically important to uh, success? I'm assuming it is the case because um, you've all identified uh, some of the things. Yeah, okay, thanks, Jenny. Yeah, this is true. Yeah, so, um, you know, so if you're a teacher, of course, we expect people to be very, very good at the technical aspects of teaching. But if they don't have those, some of those non-job roles, they're obviously going to be found wanting professionally. Stephen makes the point, yes, I can train competence. I can't train character. Yes, well said, Stephen. And, and this is why recruiters will often, they will go out of their way. They'll, they'll often say to me privately, at the end of the day, we're far better to recruit or select or recruit and select somebody on the basis of their um, attitude or character, as Stephen calls it, whatever you want to call it, uh, who perhaps are found wanting in the technical rather than getting someone who's technically proficient and then trying to get them to change. So, I, yeah, I agree with you. And that's certainly what recruiters would say as well. So thank you for your feedback. I'm just going to keep the webcam off, folks. Only be, uh, I like to make this personal and keep it on, but I'm just terrified that if I turn the webcam on, we're going to end up with difficult audio because it takes up a lot of bandwidth. So, so sorry about that. Just bear with me. But clearly, so far, so good. So I'm not going to touch anything and <laughs> create a problem for us all. All right, let's move on. Now, just to make the point, that I, uh, you know, the book here that I wrote, as I said, just to make the point about the job description, I actually think the, the job description has enormously negative impact on a lot of the organisation. This is why I'm sharing with this with you as a senior person in your organisation, because you can do something about this. If you think about the human resource management practices that go inside your organisation, regardless of what it is, you will find that obviously at the top, you have to recruit somebody or recruit a selection, you know, find a number of people who want to apply for the job. You've then got to make the selection. Now, what do we do in an interview? We ask people a lot of questions around the job capabilities. And then they, you know, we select somebody on the basis that they've got good job capabilities. I'm not suggesting it's not important. Don't, mis don't misunderstand my point. But we find after three months after probation that they, they become a really difficult person to work with. And had we known what we knew, what we know, now know, we probably wouldn't have selected them for the job, even though on paper they looked wonderful. So, again, because we tailor the questions around the job interview around the technical aspects of what people do. And then when we induct people into the workplace, the successful candidate that is, we tend to talk to them about the technical aspects of their work. We don't usually talk about the values. We don't usually talk about the non-job roles. And so therefore people start to think that all I've got to do is rock up and do my job based on my job description and everything will be fine. And then when we train and develop people, guess where we spend our money? 80% of the money that's been expended in organisations is to improve people's job tasks. Now, again, I'm not saying that those things aren't important. I'm simply making the, the comment that we, we are skewed towards building people's uh, job capabilities up and sometimes at the expense of some of the other things that we've looked at today. 
And then, of course, we give people pay rises often on the basis of, you know, how do we how do we give people pay rises often in their technical capabilities, but probably more importantly, we often do elevate people to leadership roles because they happen to be the best accountant or because they happen to be the best um you know, the best uh, engineer or whatever it might be. And so people uh, aspire to leadership roles and are often selected in those roles because they've got really good technical skills, which isn't exactly what we want, is it, as far as leaders? And then, of course, you know, when we review people's performance, we start to review them on the basis of their job again. We don't even go near the non-job. And uh, even when we have to sack somebody, we usually try to, usually the reason we're sacking someone, if we're perfectly honest about it, is because they're not doing the non-job roles very well. And so, but of course we feel that we've got to have a legal case. So we try and find, we try and pick holes in what they do technically so that we can justify the decision. You see, so what the point I'm trying to make here, of course, is that the job description negatively impacts most of the uh, practices that occur in workplaces around human resources. And that is a problem. So I think my suggestion to you is to really rethink your whole work document. If you can change that and get that right and elevate the non-job roles, you'll find that it will actually impact positively on all of the things that you're seeing in front of you. So if you've got any questions or comments, go for your life. I'm interested to hear. Okay, now I would just uh, want to talk about uh, a substitute for the performance review. Now, it, I, some of you I know are working in uh, government departments and you're probably thinking, I don't like the performance review, but I can't do anything about it. That's okay. What you can do is you can create a better perform performance appraisal by enabling uh, a conversation culture. And what you're seeing in front of you is the five conversations framework. Now, the five conversations framework I actually put in place because I thought we needed a substitute for the performance review because I couldn't find any research anywhere in the world that suggested that performance reviews actually increase performance. And so I decided to look for something else. Now, Chris is just um, making a point here, and I just want to read it out, if you don't mind, Chris. Does this assume that job role skill component can be on the job training education, that the job role skill, if you are a star performer on non-job roles. For example, being a board member requires more than just non-job roles. Um, Chris, I think what I, I I think what I'm getting at is that we I mean obviously we want people who are qualified to do the job. I mean that that to me is a, you know is a basic proposition. We just want people who've got a skill set. However, what I'm making the point is that, yes, um, in many respects, those people uh, are not necessarily going to be productive just because they happen to have good technical skills. And the point that I'm making is that um, the differentiator is, uh, is indeed the fact that people have um, good non-job roles. Now, you make the point here at the end. For example, being a board member requires more than just non-job roles. Chris, we select people on the basis of their uh, their their technical know-how and experience on boards because that's important. I totally agree with you. However, if you look at any good board member, and I'm on uh, one, I'm not suggesting I'm a good one, but I'm on one. If you look at any good board member, you will find that what will differentiate them from the other board members around the table is probably their interpersonal skills, their communication skills, their enthusiasm and all of these other things. But um, so that's a value add. Uh, so, you know, I'm just 
I just wanted to get that clear that yes, of course, technical skills are important, but if we rely totally on that, we're missing the point around performance. So Chris, I'm not sure I've nailed that for you, but uh, I'm just adding to uh, adding my comments to that if I can. So let me know if I'm I'm off the mark. Okay, so let's get into the non-job. Let's get into this five conversations framework. Now you can notice on the left hand side you've got five months and so what this means is that you create a culture of conversation in your workplace where everybody in your organisation actually is expected to have a conversation once a month about a topic and I've given you the topics and uh, let me just run through those topics with you. Uh, oh thanks Chris, I'm glad I did make sense. I I often worry about that, so thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the feedback. Okay, so uh, the conversation. So in month one, now, by the way, these conversations go for about 15 to 20 minutes, no more. Now, um, people will say, they get skeptical and say, oh, you know, you can have a meaningful conversation for 20 minutes. You don't need to go for an hour to have a meaningful conversation. The other point is that sometimes it might be worth going for an hour and that's okay as well. But at the, at the end of the day, the questions around this are designed to just, um, you know, go for 20 minutes. So we have a check-in once a month. The first month, month is a climate review conversation, which of course has nothing to do with the weather. So this is around people's job, job satisfaction, morale and communication. In fact, the first question that's asked in the framework is, on a scale of one to 10, 10 is high, one is low, how would you rate your current job satisfaction? Now, um, it doesn't really matter what the person says because some will say you know, four, some will say six, some will say seven. The next question is the key, why? So what I'm actually wanting to know is where people are at right now. Now, of course, job description, the job satisfaction ebbs and flows. We understand that, but we spend thousands of dollars a year, if not tens and even hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on, on, on surveys online every year, mind the surveys. And what happens is that no, people get very cynical because they say, well, nothing changes, so why should I fill it out? What's to stop the leader just sitting down and having that with, as a conversation? Why do you have to do it online? Now, people might say that people are more honest online. Well, are they really? Can we really make that that can we make that um, can we make that judgment? Um, and and if people are more honest online than they would be in a conversation with their manager, then I would be saying, well, there's something wrong with the employment relationship because obviously trust isn't very high. The second month is talking about strengths and talents. So this is instead of us going for the straight for the jugular and talking what what people are poor at. How about we talk about their innate talents and their strengths? This is based on positive psychology, which has been around for 30 odd years. Martin Seligman and so forth. These people have uh, pioneered positive psychology, which argues that we should work with people's strengths rather than just go straight for weaknesses. So you might say, how in heaven's name would I start a conversation about strengths? Well, here's the best way to do it. I would ask you if we were in an interview, I would say in a, in a conversation, I'd say, um, I won't mention anyone's name, I'd say, what's the one thing that you enjoy most about the work that you do here? Now, most people will have an answer for that, hopefully. <laughs> if they say nothing, well, I'd be, you know, saying, well, why are you here? But let's say they did say something. Um, what you have actually done is you've identified their strength because we have we do know from research that there's a high correlation between what people actually enjoy and what they're good at, right? And it's based on the three P principle. We tend to practice what we prefer and we ultimately become proficient. So ultimately what you've actually done is unearthed the strength and then of course, the rest of the conversation can be around whether or not and if and how we can actually assist you to uh, use and utilize those strengths more effectively in your own workplace, which is a great thing. 
Month three, we talk about opportunities for growth. And of course, again, I ask the person to come to the meeting having thought about something they've got, they'd like to work on over the next 12 months. So I'm giving them some accountability and responsibility around that. Learning and development, are the month two and three conversations have probably led on to a number of different learning opportunities, which isn't necessarily about sending someone off to a training course. It might be coaching, mentoring, explaining or whatever, but I'm now in a position where I can have a conversation about that. Now, again, HR spends a lot of time doing what they call a training needs analysis every year. Why can't we just talk about those things and collect that data at the team level and feed it back to HR? It just seems so much more sensible to me. And then month five, we talk about ways and means of making the organisation more efficient and effective by having an innovation and continuous improvement conversation. So whereas conversation four is about themselves, whereas conversation five is about the organisation. Now, can you see the link between this and the non-job roles I was talking about before? If you could, if you could, if you could implement this in your workplace, and I'm not just talking about you. What about if you got your whole organisation to be doing this? Would that make a difference? I think it would if every manager was expected to have five, 10 to 15 minute conversations around these themes over a five month period. I will guarantee to you that the culture of your workplace, that's the performance culture, will change significantly. How do I know that? Because wherever I've implemented this in other workplaces, we have done a before and after survey, and it's very obvious that there is a significant improvement in performance after five months. Now, I actually believe that this should be done twice a year. I don't think it's a big ask to have 10, 20 minute conversations every year with your direct reports about their development. It's not a big deal. And anyone that says it is, is probably not really thinking about themselves in that leadership capacity. So there's food for thought. Now, if you, you're interested in implementing that in your workplace, um, talk to me offline about this and I can uh, you know, talk about this in more detail. But I simply wanted to say that creating a conversation culture in your workplace is a significant uh, factor towards improving your performance. And I, um, you don't have to get rid of your performance review, although I'm not sure that it's serving you as well as you might think. But if, it, if you can't get rid of it, then use this as, as an enabler, as we say. All right, we're almost done. So um, I just wanted to uh, talk about the, yeah, just quickly, the initiative paradox is the concept where I think it's a fascinating, it's gonna be, uh, I'm, 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 that's my next book, by the way, but I, I'm a bit of a way off from that. I'm still putting the finishing touches to the one at the moment. But so let's look at how it works. Leaders want initiative from employees. You want people to show initiative, don't you? Of course you do. So what you do is you invite initiative from your team. So you say to your team members, I want you to show initiative. All right. And then people are sitting there thinking to themselves, he or she doesn't really mean that. And then of course, um, they sit on their hands. And then the leader, that's you, sits there and think, oh, this stuff doesn't work. I'm gonna jump in and do it myself. And then everyone else is sitting there thinking, aha, I knew they didn't really mean it. That's what I mean about the initiative paradox. So it's a very interesting way of thinking about why people aren't proactive and in showing initiative. All right, now, homework. What I'd like you to do, because I'm just running out of time, I would like you to commit to a schedule of regular developmental conversations with your direct reports. I think if you said to me, what's one thing I can take away that will make a big difference? If you're not having regular check-ins, and even if you're in isolation, you can still do this online, then get into this process and use the five conversations if you wish, or if you don't, try something else you'll be amazed at the difference it'll make. So I want you to give that a shot. 
And the next time we meet, and I'll be sending you out an email shortly, but the next time we meet, we're going to look at influencing capabilities. So that's it, folks. So thank you. Um, I um, we got through it all right. I shouldn't. I'm, I mean, yeah, we had a bit of problem with the sound early, but it must have been coming out all right at the end. So thanks, everyone. Um, I can turn on my webcam now, just so you know I'm a human being. I'm not just sitting here pretending to. Whoops. Okay. All right, so folks, thank you. We'll catch you in two weeks' time and uh, look forward to, uh, to hearing your war stories. Thanks, everyone. All the best and goodbye.